We have here a schematic for a shell and tube heat exchanger. We have oil coming in the shell side of the exchanger at 160 degrees Celsius. It flows around the baffles here in a horseshoe type shape and it flows out the outlet of the shell side of the exchanger. It comes in the tube side of the exchanger, cold water, and heat is exchanged and is heated up and comes out at a higher temperature of 90.5 degrees Celsius. 90.5 was selected because that is the minimum part of the range for the ideal coffee brewing temperature. So we're brewing coffee and we're brewing four kilograms of coffee every second. So this might be a coffee shop in Seattle or someplace like that. So the pipes here, standardized pipes. This is in units of inches. Real quick, let's convert that to meters because we're gonna be using a Reynolds number in a second here. 254, this is the conversion inches to meters. This is in units of inches, it cancels out here. And you are gonna get 0 0.009525 meters. Now notice that is the outside diameter of the pipe. For the Reynolds number, we're gonna need the inside diameter of the pipe. So if the pipe looks like this, we know from here to here, we're gonna want the inside diameter and we know the wall thickness. So we're gonna take from here to here, minus this portion, minus this portion. And I'll let you do that on your own, but we will have an inside diameter of 0 0.007747 meters. Okay, so a couple things to notice about this problem. First of all, this is the convection coefficient per unit length. I gave it per unit length because it makes it easier to solve at the end. In reality, you would need to either assume a convection coefficient or calculate it yourself or get it from experimentation. It's a little bit too much for this problem though, so we're just gonna have it, 500 watts per meter Kelvin. And you'll see that because it is per unit length, it is per meter Kelvin as opposed to per meter squared Kelvin, which are the normal units for a convection coefficient. Also notice that we have temperatures. All our boundary condition temperatures are given to us. And because of that, we can have all the fluid properties. These are properties you would normally get from a table. Well, you would get them from a table. I got them from the table, these from a table, and I, I actually just looked these up in my textbook. This is roughly based on a textbook problem, so. Okay, and the reason we have all the different, you know, the Prandtl number, the dynamic viscosity, and the conduction coefficient for water is because we don't know the heat transfer coefficient, the convection coefficient for the inside of the tubes here. We do know it from the outside of the tube, so we don't need to look up all these numbers. If we were actually calculating that, we would have all these properties for the oil as well as the water. So, we have the properties, we need to find thermal resistance. First of all though, we are gonna look at the heat transfer. And we're gonna use that to solve for the mass flow rate of the oil. So let's do that right now. Q equals the mass flow rate of the water. We're doing this for the cold side. Heat transfer rate. We're doing it for the cold side because it's the same as the hot side. We can see that heat, this is hot oil over here, and this is cold water in here, heat flowing in. Well, heat flowing in is the same as heat flowing out of the oil. So we solve for one Q, we have both Qs, both heat flow rates. So we got M dot, that's the mass flow rate. We multiply it by the specific heat of the water here, and we multiply that by the change in temperature. Flow rate is a di design requirement, four kilograms per second, specific heat for water. And we got that earlier, I'm not gonna bring that up, but you can rewind if you want. This is joules per kilogram Kelvin, and we have a delta T of 90.5 minus 25. 
this is going to give us a total wattage or total heat transfer rate of 1.0096665 times 10 to the 6 watts. And I'll leave it to you to verify that the units here are correct. So this is our heat transfer rate for both the cold side and the hot side as we discussed here. Heat coming in here must necessarily come from heat going out here. So we're able to rewrite this equation and for the hot side we can get m dot equals and we take these two terms over here so these will be in the denominator I'll just write it right now q over c sub p times delta t and that will look like again same q value but now we do C sub P for the hot fluid, which is a little bit higher. Oil is able to store a little bit more temperature than water. And then 160 minus 100, that is the delta T. And you should get 7.8 kilograms per second. One of these should have been, I believe this is, should be a minus actually out minus n but I'll just write heat heat loss this is the heat loss from the oil and the heat gained by the water in this particular schematic so yeah this these two should have been reversed but you get the idea this is the convection rate equation and this is another use of our heat flow rate and we're going to be using it to solve for the length of the pipe we need to actually make this heat exchanger work given our design requirements. So U here is the heat transfer co coefficient or it's sometimes abbreviated simply to overall heat overall coefficient. A is the area of the exposed pipe and delta T L M is the log mean temperature difference. So because we're dealing with the outside area of the pipe and the inside area of the pipe. We're going to rewrite, instead of using this, instead of using this, we're going to use 1 divided by the thermal resistance. We're going to do a thermal resistance approach to solve the problem. But before we do that, let's solve for F, which is the correction factor, and delta T log mean the log mean temperature difference. We're not gonna talk about either of these. We're just gonna solve it for this video and uh, we might talk about it a little bit later. So first for the log mean temperature difference, it is temperature hot inlet minus temperature cold outlet. This guy, hot outlet minus cold inlet. This guy minus this guy. And in the bottom, it's the same terms but it is a logarithm and a ratio, or a logarithm of this one minus the logarithm of this one. And by properties of logarithms, those two expressions would be equivalent. So we'll go ahead and solve for delta T log min because it's required in our solution. We have, let's see, 160 temperature hot inlet minus 90.5 temperature cold outlet minus temperature hot outlet minus temperature cold inlet which is 25 I have enough space and in the denominator here again it's just the same thing terms are in the same order it's just the ratio of the logarithms now and we'll close off these if you calculate that out it should come out to 72 point 2151 degrees Celsius or Kelvin. It's a ratio here, or the, rather the difference, so it doesn't matter what type of units you work, use. And let's look at the correction factor. Okay, this chart, you'll see here we have a diagram of the heat exchanger this is used for, and it looks a lot what we're using, so this should give you some warm and fuzzy for our correction factor calculations. Let's solve for 
R, which will be T1, no, over here, T1 would be the 160, minus T2 will be 100, just matching the what we have here in their schematic with our schematic, if we match up these numbers, 90.5 minus 25, so hot temperatures, hot side, or shell side in the numerator and cold side in the denominator. And same thing with the P. I mean, this might take you a second to actually, you know, look at it and really get it, but if you just match their schematic with our schematic, you will get these numbers. And this is equal to 0 0.485, 0 0.485, I'll write it down here. All right, so first thing, let's get a value for P, and that's on the x-axis here, 0.485. So we are looking 0.4 about right here. What we're gonna do is get an angle of 90 degrees. So we're here and we'll draw a line straight across here. Great. And we're gonna use a horizontal ruler in a second. So that's our p-value on the x-axis, and then we're going to use the r-value. That's the value of the curve we're using. That's how we select our curve. So 0.9, looks like we're using, nope, that's not it, this curve. So between this curve and this curve. It'll go up here, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, so yeah, this curve here, and it will match up to our p-value about right here. So maybe 0 0.86, 0 0.86, that is a, about the rough value of our, for our correction factor. So we have everything we need right now to solve for length except for thermal resistance, R. We have the correction factor, the log mean temperature difference, as well as the heat flow rate. So let's go ahead and solve for R and the length of the pipe that'll be included in the radius term. That's our unknown variable. So if we take the wall itself, finding the thermal resistance here is a little bit easier. It will just be the ratio, the logarithm of the outside diameter divided by inside diameter, that ratio there which, if I look at my notes, it was 0 0.09925 divided by 0 0.007747. Okay, and this could be in inches. I just kept it in meters for no reason, maybe just to be simpler. And this is the thermal resistance for a cylindrical geometry. So you got 2 pi times the Conduction coefficient is about 400 watts per meter Kelvin for copper times the length. So that's the value for resistance of the wall. Itself resistance for outside, which will be a function of the convection coefficient. Well, this was already given to us. So that will be one divided by 500 times the length. That was just given to us. Now comes the part that's a little bit more involved and that's cal calculating the conduction resistance or we start out by calculating the convection coefficient for the inside of the wall and from that we get the resistance. So we want to H inside we start with the Reynolds number and this is why we got all those fluid properties earlier because we need them to calculate Reynolds. 4 times M dot which is, you know what, I'm gonna write it out first, just the equation for Reynolds number. This is the diameter of the inside and this is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. You can derive this Reynolds number if you take um, the other way to write it is rho V times the characteristic dimension, diameter in this case divided by mu. Inside diameter. These two expressions are the same thing. 
and you can you can do some math and prove that to yourself if you want. So we solve four times the mass flow rate is four times pi times the inside diameter 0 0.007747 times the dynamic viscosity, which is 4.854 times 10 to the minus four. You go for this one, solve it out, and you get a really big Reynolds number. The critical num Reynolds number for pipes is 2300. This should be RE critical, which means if it's above 2300, it is turbulent. And this is well above 2300. This is an extremely turbulent flow inside of this pipe. So we're good on being turbulent. Next from the Reynolds number, we want to calculate the Nusselt number. And because this is turbulent, we can use the Ditas Bolter correlation, which is for flow inside of pipes, 0 0.023 times the Reynolds number to the four fifths times the Prandtl number to the N. And if N equals 0 0.4, if heat is coming into the pipe, and as we discussed earlier, heat is coming in from the hot oil into the cold water, so it is coming in. So we will have a value of 0.4. If this pipe is hot and the shell side is cold, you would use N equals 0 0.3. Hot in, hot out. Cool. So we go ahead and plug in our numbers here. The Reynolds number is 1.35 times 10 to the 6. Really big. And our Prandtl number, that comes from our fluid properties based on our average temperature values. And it was given earlier in the video as 2.9205. And this is to the N, which is 0 0.4. We come up with a ridiculously big Nussle number of 2,839.88. Nussle numbers are normally in the hundreds, not thousands. So there, there's probably a lot of problems with this that would otherwise come up because you're using really small pipes for a really, really big flow rate. It's probably going to break, but we're going to continue analyzing anyway. So H is given by the conduction coefficient for water, also found earlier from the average temperatures, times the Nusselt number divided by the length. Nope, divided by the diameter, the characteristic to, um, geometry. If, it, if you're doing a flat plate, it would be length. In this case, it is diameter. So here again we're referring to the inside diameter 0 0.007747. This is a mix of symbolic and numerical. Conduction coefficient, Nusselt number, characteristic dimension. I fixed it. Cool. So the convection coefficient here comes out to be the ridiculously large that is a really big number 240 watts per square meter Kelvin now that we have convection coefficient for the inside wall we can put all our terms together this is for the outside wall it was given to us and it is a function of length at the denominator this is for the wall itself and this is based off of the geometry of the pipe as well as the thermal conductivity of the pipe which I didn't include and this should be here 400 watts per meter Kelvin really good thermal conductivity for a copper pipe and this is the convection coefficient which we just calculated it is multiplied by pi times diameter times the length and that will be the area the inside of the pipes area if we kind of rewrite all these equations 
and simplify it, we can factor out L as well. So we factored it out here. And I did not write the terms in the same order. I switched this term and this term. This is still the outside of the pipe, 1 over 500. This is the pipe itself. And this is the convection coefficient for the inside of the pipe. So if we stop for a second and just brain and think about what's holding us back for our heat transfer, well, we know that it's definitely not the pipe itself. The copper pipe is conducting extremely well in order of magnitude better than this convection coefficient. More, however, the inside of the pipe seems to be conducting a lot better than this side of the pipe. So if there's one area we want to focus on, maybe it's make, getting a more turbulent flow here on the shell side of the exchanger, trying to bring this 1 over 500 into 1 over 10,000 or something like that. Or maybe we can save some money by switching to PVC. That's a really stupid idea because PVC has a thermal conductivity of 0.19 versus copper's 400. So, I mean, and it's thicker too. So that probably wouldn't work, but it's just something to think about. And when you, you know, build your circuit diagram, your thermal circuit diagram, and then you actually write the numbers, you can see where you might be able to save some money or improve efficiency, which is part of engineering. So we go ahead and we solve this and we get one over 444 times the length. That is our thermal resistance. Now all we have to do is solve for L. So we use this equation. This is known, this is known, this is known, and this is known. The only thing unknown is L, which is perfect. So if we, let's just go ahead and write it. Q equals one over R, 444 L. We took the inverse of this guy times our correction factor times log mean temperature difference. So we solve for L. We're going to have Q in the numerator. And it's the same value we got at the beginning part of this problem. We are going to divide by 444. We are going to divide by the correction factor, which is 0 0.86. We got that from the graphic earlier. And we are going to divide by the log mean temperature difference, which See if I can find it, 72.2151. Cool, so we go ahead and we solve it and we get a length of approximately 40 meters. And that's the total length of the pipe here, not the length of the shell itself. It's folded over itself four times, so the shell would need to be about 10 meters. Or one of the ways we could do it is stack more pipes in here, that might make the shell side flow a little bit more turbulent and might actually increase our convection coefficient and make it a more efficient design overall. So that's pretty much it for a shell and tube design. One thing to note is you might not always have inlet and outlet temperatures and that's where you're going to need to get into some design iteration and it gets a little bit more complicated. It's easier as if, if you know the temperatures but we anyway, hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching and take care.